Good morning. The call to worship this morning is found in Psalm 105, verses 1 through 3. Give praise to the Lord. Proclaim his name. Make known among the nations what he has done. Sing to him. Sing praise to him. Tell of all his wonderful acts. Glory in his holy name. Let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. And would you stand with us this morning as we sing together and worship our Lord and Savior? Songs are in an insert in your bulletin or up on the monitor for you.
I just um, praise and thank you, Lord, for all that you've done for us, for dying on the cross, for rising again, and Lord, um, forgiving our sins, Lord, so that one day we might live in heaven with you. Lord, I just pray that you be here in our midst this morning as we hear your word being preached and that it would strengthen us for the week ahead. Lord, I pray that all our hearts and our minds would be turned towards you. In your name I pray. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, all glory and praise to you. We thank you, God, for these praise songs and opportunity to give you praise. We know we often come with hearts that are heavy or guilt that's been pushed back and down. Lord God, we pray you'd bring to our attention this time those things which we need to confess before you. Amen. Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning because of our old nature. There is a part of us that only wants to make us turn away from you and do that which is evil. At times, Father, we have given in to this old nature and have sinned and fallen short of your glory. We confess this to you so that we may for, you may forgive us and cleanse us from all righteousness. Wash us and make us clean in your sight. In the precious name of Jesus Christ, amen. And from Isaiah chapter 44, verse 22. Actually, we are at verse 22, 21 and 22. I have swept away your offenses like a cloud, your sins like the morning mist. Return to me, for I have redeemed you. Sing for joy, O heavens, for the Lord has done this, shot a lot of earth beneath, burst into song, you mountains, you forests, and all your trees, for the Lord has redeemed Jacob, he displays his glory in Israel. Amen. Our first reading today is found in Genesis 17, verses 1 through 16, and that's found on page 11 of your pew Bible. Genesis 17, 1 through 16. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to him and said, I am God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless. I will confirm my covenant between me and and you, and will greatly increase your numbers. Abram fell face down, and God said to him, As for me, this is my covenant with you. You will be the father of many nations. No longer will you be called Abram. Your name will be Abraham. For I have made you a father of many nations. I will make you very fruitful. I will make nations of you, and kings will come from you. I will establish my covenant as an everlasting covenant between me and you and your descendants after you for the generations to come, to be your God and the God of your descendants after you. The whole land of Canaan, where you are now an alien, I will give as an everlasting possession to you and your descendants after you, and I will be their God. Then God said to Abraham, as for you, you must keep my covenant, 
you and your descendants after you for the generations to come. This is my covenant with you and your descendants after you, the covenant you are to keep. Every male among you shall be circumcised. You are to undergo circumcision, and I will be the sign of the covenant between me and you. For the generations to come, every male among you who is eight days old must be circumcised, including those born in your household or, brought, or bought with many money from a foreigner, those who are not your offspring. Whether born in your household or bought with your money, you must be circumcised. My covenant in your flesh is to be an everlasting covenant. Any circumcised male who has not been circumcised in the flesh will be cut off from his people. He has broken my covenant. God also said to Abraham, As for Sari, your wife, you are no longer to call her Sari. Her name will be Sarah. I will bless her, and I will surely give you a son by her. I will bless her so that she will be the mother of nations. Kings of people will come from her. Our second reading is found on page 798 in your pew Bible. It's Romans 5, 1 through 11. Romans 5, 1 through 11. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into his grace in which we now stand, and we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we also rejoice in our sufferings, because we know that sufferings produce perseverance, perseverance character, and character hope. And hope does not disappoint us, because God has poured out his love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit, whom he has given us. You see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous man, though for a good man, someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? For if, when we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? Not only is this so, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. Here ends our reading. I invite you to stand and let's profess our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated in the right hand of God the Father Almighty, from where he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
Heavenly Father, thank you very much for these tithes, these gifts, these offerings. Thank you, Lord God, for blessings that overflow in our lives. We pray, Heavenly Father, you will use these things to your glory. With your word and your Holy Spirit, we pray we'll use these things, God, to get the gospel out into the hearts and minds and lives of people. And we also pray, Father, that others will be encouraged greatly. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Good morning. Welcome to worship. Glad that you're here and welcome those online too. We pray God's blessings as we hear his word and uh, come to him in worship and prayer. You'll see some announcements listed in the bulletin. Go ahead and take a look at those. We have a Sunday school class for the adults today called In His Image, and we're using a video that is found online. Can be used. You can use it at home too if you don't make it today or can make it another time. We'll go through it about uh, four sessions it'll take us to go through. It's about an hour and 40 minutes long. But it's called In His Image, put out by American Family Association. And uh, like I said, it's online too. So it'd be great, uh, really encouragement for you to see it. It has to do with uh, um, gender identity and things like this. And this is obviously a very big topic of our time. And uh, God has spoken to this. And so I invite you to come and check it out and be encouraged. Also... You know the congregational meeting is going to be held on March 14th, immediately after church, having to do with uh, considering a proposal for a church computer, etc., and also ideas for outreach uh, of the gospel in our area. I don't, we don't have it in here, but uh, on the 14th, that same day at night, or in, I'm sorry, in the afternoon at 4, there's going to be, uh, it's in the calendar, maybe it is. Uh, I guess it's in the calendar, it's out in the back, though, you'll see it there. That's, uh, I can't remember the doctor's name. What's his name? Joe Burns. Joe Burns. All right. And he's going to be speaking upon uh, the crucifixion. And it's obviously a very appropriate time of year to be talking about this. And it's what we, during the time we call family night, but everybody is welcome to come to it. And uh, I think it'll be a blessed time. So please put that on your calendars. All right. And also, any updates regarding the potato ham dinner? Any updates? Sign up. No, the sign up sheet is on the table right here. Okay, sign up sheets on the counter back there. Very good. Anything else? Other announcements? All right. We're going to keep in prayer various people. <clears throat> We're going to keep on praying for newborn, new grandson to Marlon and Renee. His name's Will. And uh, did have some good news yesterday, but they said he has a little setback and he's no longer able to be held. He still needs oxygen and has a feeding tube. All the tests have not indicated anything, but they're treating him with antibiotics. So they welcome, appreciate uh, continued prayers. All right, what else? Other praises or prayer requests? Sorry? Okay. Bob's Coog family. Okay. What else? Did they figure out what was going on with Natalia? Um, no, not really. Okay. All right. We praise the Lord that she has improved, huh? All right. What else? Thea, glad you're here. Surgery went well. What? Surgery went really well. Yeah. Good. All right. We'll pray for you too, Vern. All right. What else? Praises, requests? Yep. Uh, my sister-in-law's mother, Carol, for healing. 
Okay. Sandy's sister-in-law's mother, Carol, for healing for her. All right, anything else? I invite you to join me in prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, we praise you and thank you for your goodness, for your grace in our lives, for your word in our life. Father, just uh, speak to us every day and help us to listen, to receive all you have to give to us. Father, we lift up to you, baby Will, and we pray your uh, healing and strength to him. Bless him and bless his parents and their family. Lord God, we just thank you for help that's available. We give into your hands, God. And uh, thank you. We lift up to you, Thea and Vern. Continue to bring healing in both of them and their feet. And Lord, we just pray you be honored and, and glorified. Thank you, Lord. And for Bob Skoog family, we pray for them as they miss him and uh, grieve and remind them of your presence and your victory over sin and death. And uh, just thank you, Lord God, for Bob's life. Lord, we lift up to you, Natalia. Thank you that she's home, and thank you that her pain is lessened so much and that she's so improved, and we just pray continued healing for her. Bless Natalia. And we lift up to you, Carol, Sandy's sister-in-law's mother. We pray for healing for Carol. She had lots of health challenges, God, but we thank you for the help you give and the healing you give. Thank you and bless her. Lord, help us to have opportunities to share the gospel. <clears throat> help us not to be ashamed of you at all, but rather be proud of you and honor you and speak boldly of you and the great things that you've done. Thank you, Lord God. Lord, we lift up to you the uh, upcoming potato and ham dinner. We pray your blessings upon the youth in setting that up and uh, people, all the people helping with that to help make it go and the support for that. Thank you for that opportunity. May you be honored and glorified in it, God. Lord, we lift up to you, President Biden, Vice President Harris. We pray, Heavenly Father, that they will be people who humble themselves before you and that they will place their trust fully in you. Likewise, we pray for the Senate and the House and the Supreme Court justices. We pray, God, that they will realize their own uh, frailty and their own uh, shortness of uh, the shortness of life, the brevity of it, so that they will humble themselves before you, repent, and come to saving faith in you. Thank you, Lord God. We pray for revival in this nation. Not only in this nation, but God, in, right here in this church, in our families, we pray, Heavenly Father, that people just wake up to you everywhere and be alert to your presence. And also fear and honor you and respect and love you and serve you. Heavenly Father, we know that no one is truly living without knowing you. And we think of the verse, which we'll hear in a bit, about how even you know, if someone were to gain the entire world, you know, that's no benefit in the end. So, Heavenly Father, we just pray for a stirring of your spirit and for people to come to repentance in this nation. All these things we pray, God, in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Let's sing to God be the glory. Number 509 in your ambassador hymnal. Oh, come 
to the Father, through Jesus the Son, and give him the glory, great things he hath done. O perfect redemption, the purchase of blood, to every believer the promise of God. The vilest defender who truly believes that moment from Jesus a pardon receives. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son, and give him the glory, great things he hath done. Great things he hath taught us, great things he hath done, and great our rejoicing through Jesus the Son, but purer and higher and greater will be our wonder, our transport, when Jesus we see. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son and give him the glory, great things he hath done. I invite the children up now for the children's message. Come on, children. All right, can you back up a little bit? Not too close here, a little bit more. Yeah, there we go. All right. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> Good morning. Good morning. We're all here. There you go. Hey, how many of you got clean before you came to church? Did you have to take a shower, bath, or anything? Yesterday you did, you know, last week maybe, for the guys. I don't know. Well, last week was, what, just a day ago. So, <laughs> so anyway, you get it? Like, this is a new week Sunday. Anyway, so you got cleaned up a little bit? Nope, nope. He says no, definitely not. <laughs> well, just in case you didn't, ha, I brought myself a washcloth for you here. For your face, if you, well, you know, no what? Water Where's the water? <laughs> you need it. You knew I wasn't going to go that wash. far, didn't you? <laughs> wash. Wash when you wash. have to use water. Mm. <laughs> that looks like an old one, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Still works, though. Still works. You know? So you're telling me, like, what happens, what would happen if you came to church... And you had dirty clothes on because you just got maybe Ooh. back from doing some work, you know, somewhere, whatever. You had, and you, oh, I gotta get to church. Is that okay? It's okay to come in dirty clothes, doesn't it? I mean, you, if you don't, you probably don't want to. If you, your parents probably don't want you to. But if you have to, it's better to come than not to come, right? In fact, it, you don't have to have beautiful clothes. You can just come as you are. In fact, we sing a song that says that. Come, come as you are, you know. But you know what? What I get at is this. Whatever clothes you wear, it's important to come and respect and honor the Lord, right? We're worshiping Him. We're serving Him. We're trusting Him. But you know what? Spiritually, where's that washcloth? Can I see that? Spiritually, that want, you know, we are not able to clean ourselves inside spiritually. We just can't do that. And what's really kind of funny is we're going to hear a verse in a few seconds from Romans that says that you don't have to, you can't get cleaned up to come to God. You, get, you can't get better to come to God. You know what he does instead? He comes, he comes to you, right. He comes to you and he cleans you inside. And how does that happen? It's by God's freely given gift, by grace through faith in Jesus. That he died on the cross for you and for your sins. He comes to you and cleans you. 
So like, when you come to church, you can get clean when you come to church. But he meets us right where we're at. You don't have to become a better person to know Jesus, though he will make you a better person. But it's because of him. It's amazing what God does. So I'm going to read this verse to you now from Romans chapter 5, verse 8. Listen to this. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. You didn't have to become better to know God. In fact, everybody's a sinner on earth, right? Everybody's a sinner. Can I see that? Thanks. I'm going to hold on to that for a minute. Ooh, that's what that is. Everybody's a sinner, and Jesus comes to everybody. He, he comes to everybody, but everybody doesn't receive him. But you hope that they will. Because when you do that, guess what happens? You clean inside. He makes us right and good before God's presence. Well, Romans 5, 8, again, I'm going to read that to you. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. We didn't have to get better. He came to us when we were sinners. And we praise God for that. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you very much that you came to us when we were sinners. We didn't have to get clean to come to you, but you took the sin upon yourself and came to us. You came to us in your love, and we say thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. Here we go. I'll take it. Thanks. I invite you to stand for the reading of the gospel. The gospel today is from Mark chapter 8. I invite you to turn to that in your Bibles. Mark chapter 8, beginning at verse 27. Jesus and his disciples went on to the villages around Caesarea Philippi. On the way, he asked them, Who do people say that I am? They replied, Some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, one of the prophets. But what about you, he asked. Who do you say I am? Peter answered, you are the Christ. Jesus warned them not to tell anyone about him. He then began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, chief priests, and teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and after three days rise again. He spoke plainly about this, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But when Jesus turned and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter. Get behind me, Satan, he said. You do not have in mind the things of God, but the things of men. Then he called the crowd to him along with his disciples and said, If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for me and for the gospel will save it. What good is it for a man to gain the whole world, yet forfeit his soul? Or what can a man give in exchange for his soul? If anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of him. And when he comes in his Father's glory with the holy angels. This is the gospel of our Lord. Please be seated. Let's pray. Gracious God, you give us this amazing word and challenging word. And we pray, Heavenly Father, you will just help us to hear you even further in this time what you have to Say to us, and we can apply it to our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I remember seeing some time ago an article about uh, colleges that were you know, taking applications. And uh, a lot of people filled those applications out, sent them in, and and uh, it was a rather prestigious college, and they were looking for uh, just to see what people would say, and 
uh, they wanted to see why they should be allowed in there, and a lot of people stated leadership qualities and that they were a leader and that they were this and that, you know. And anyway, it was seen like only one person had uh, indicated that they were a follower. And this person was drawn out and attention was given to that person because uh, it was believed that everybody wants to be a leader and everybody thinks that they're a leader, but everybody's not a leader. There has to be some followers. Well, I looked at a couple uh, places to see what some businesses were looking for and some of the top things they're looking for are loyalty, integrity, sincerity, and self-reliance. There's lots of other things too, but we'll hear some other things uh, repeated here. Another place said they're looking for, of course, communication skills, but honesty and loyalty. And you think about that, I think, wow, you know, if they could find some people who were Christians, who were taking their faith seriously, living for God, that's the kind of person they'd want to hire, right? Because they're going to have integrity. They're going to be loyal. Why? Because they learned about it already. They're not just saying that they have it. Who do people say that Jesus is? That's a question he posed to his disciples. I think that's a, a great question because they had heard. A lot of people are talking about Jesus. As we know today, a lot of people are talking about uh, things that happen in society, and they have their comments on it, and they have their feedback about it, their articles. Who do people say Jesus is today? Maybe not the same things that they said back then, but a lot of similar things. What do we hear? Oh, he's a good man. You know, we hear that. Or, or he was a prophet. You know, even... Uh, another large, uh, a large religion believes that Jesus was a prophet, not Christian, but they'll say, oh, he, they'll say he was a leader. They'll say all kinds of things. Some might say he's God. Peter was asked that question, you know, in fact, all the disciples were. He said, but who do you say I am? That's what it comes down to. Who do you say I am? And they had opportunity to say, and Peter spoke up because he was, one of the leaders, right? I mean, people looked up to him. He spoke out, and he said, you are the Christ. It's like he hit it right on the head. That's exactly what Jesus wanted to hear, what he should have said, etc. And then we have uh, that happening, and then right after that, he's rebuked. He's strongly warned. What? I want to ask this question before I talk about that rebuke. Why did Jesus warn them not to say anything? You can see that uh, in your verse here in 6, no, I'm sorry, 30, verse 30. He says, he, Jesus warned them not to tell anyone about him. Doesn't that sound kind of strange, you know? He gets it right on the head. Why should they not tell anyone about him? This is a theme all throughout the Gospel of Mark where he tells him to be quiet, not to tell anyone. Why? It's not his time yet for people to know, because when they find this out, or when they realize it, they're going to crucify him. And we know that that's what he talks about very soon, too. Jesus It's called the Messianic Secret, by the way. There's other names for it, too. But it was between him and his disciples, his followers, to know this, and not for the general, the rest of the people to know. They didn't understand. Jesus predicted that uh, the Son of Man, the Christ, that he would suffer. He would be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the teachers of the law. And he must be killed and then after three days rise again. What Jesus said didn't match Peter's understanding of the Messiah apparently. Because Peter said, you know, you're the Christ. And they had this idea what the Christ was. And again, it's the culture's idea, the Jewish culture's idea, what the Messiah was. It wasn't Jesus or God's understanding what the Messiah was. So when Peter heard this, it's a conflict in his thinking, and he says, 
he pulls Jesus aside and starts to rebuke him. You know? Peter's rebuking Jesus. He went from following Jesus to leading Jesus. That's when Jesus rebuked Peter. But you notice, he, he, uh, it's an interesting thing. Jesus was very harsh to him, but did you notice it says he looked at the disciples and then rebuked Peter? Why? Because I think maybe all those disciples were looking to Peter. Peter's out front here. He's leading, you know. He's telling Jesus, this is not what's supposed to happen. Jesus said, get behind me, Satan. You do not have in mind the things of God, but the things of men. It seems when a person gets out in front of Jesus, that the eyes go off of Jesus. You're not following him anymore. That's what Peter was doing. And the, the rebuke was harsh, very harsh, but very needed. All the other ones are looking too. This has to be corrected now. When you try to lead Jesus like Peter did, your mind is not on God, but on things of the world, things of men. Peter had tried to tell Jesus he didn't have to suffer, that he didn't have to be rejected by the religious leaders, and he didn't have to be killed. Friends, <laughs> that's why Jesus came to this earth, isn't it? That's why he came, to seek and to save the lost. When Peter tried to lead, he ended up saying the exact thing Satan would say. You don't have to go through this. You don't have to die. That is what Jesus does for us. He died for us. That's why he came. So the question, can you follow if you lead? Jesus did answer that question. If you try to lead Jesus, you aren't following Jesus anymore. Jesus calls people to follow Jesus, not to lead him. Because when we lead, we get our mind on things of the world, things of man. If you try to lead Jesus, you're not following him, and the safest and best place is to follow behind Jesus. So what does following Jesus look like? He says, if anyone wants to come after me, he must deny himself. That's in verse 34. I like how this man, Wearsby, said it. But we deny self when we surrender ourselves to Christ and determine to obey his will. That is when you're denying self. It doesn't mean you don't take care of yourself doesn't mean that you have to hurt yourself or feed yourself. It, it means you're to surrender yourself to him and say, I want to obey him. And even praying, Lord, help me to obey you. That is then following. That's, that's denying self. Jesus said, take up. If you want to follow him, you have to take up your cross too and follow him. So we don't have crosses much except around our necks and on the walls and on altars today. But we know what the cross was used for. And people then especially knew what the cross was used for. Because anyone who went on a cross died. So if he says, pick up your cross, they would do that. They'd carry it to their place of execution. They knew they were going to die. There's no getting out of it. The Romans were very, very good at that. And a reminder, you know, the 14th, come and find out how effective crucifixion is from Dr. Burns. It means certain death and a very painful death. The worst possible way that they could think to kill somebody. Capital punishment back in that day. Today we do it so peacefully and, and quietly in a, in a private room and so on. This was all done out in public and it was excruciating. Paul tells us that we're to die to ourselves too. But in order to follow Jesus, he says, you must deny yourself and take up your cross and follow him. 
That's how we follow Jesus, deny ourselves. Jesus said, for whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for me and for the gospel will save it. That is really a paradox, isn't it? A lot of people uh, so much try to gain and make a better life for themselves, which is a good thing. Make a better life for yourself, make a better life for your family, to, to improve your life. And that's good. We should do that. But when people have that as the main focus of their life and not... Following Jesus, there's a problem with it because that becomes their God. Yep, It becomes their, their uh, focus, the thing which they follow. The thing is to think that if you lose your life for Jesus, you end up saving it. It's like, wow, that is a paradox. It's so many paradoxes in life, and this is one of them. It's an interesting thing in here. I want to be sure to say this, too. We know that the, what the first commandment is, right? The first commandment is, you shall have no other gods before me. Right? That we shouldn't make graven images and worship these false gods. That's the first commandment. And uh, we know that we're to worship the Lord and not something else. When Peter stepped out in front of Jesus to lead him, to rebuke him. He took his eyes off Jesus, of course, and he has got his eyes on some other ideal. It's so easy to do in life to make an idol of anything <laughs> that we lift up above Jesus. What, what I'm trying to say is um, there's a connection all this with uh, the first commandment, you know, like when we are, when a person tries to save their life, it's kind of like they're trying to preserve their life, to not let it stop being the way that it is, that they want to have what the world's got, you know. But he's really talking about uh, giving up our life. Because when you give up your life for Jesus, then you end up living. You have life. It's a really strange thing that I think only faith can understand. Only Christians can understand in terms of the Word of God and the Holy Spirit. If we try to lead Jesus or God the Father or the Holy Spirit, we're essentially saying that we know what is best. It is, in other words, simply said, rebellion. It's what Satan does. What good is it for a man to gain the whole world yet forfeit his soul? What can you give in exchange for your soul? Nothing. It's the saddest thing. Someone not trusting in Jesus because they're going to lose everything. Even their own lives. Even their own soul. And Satan will have it. I think of this uh, other things, you know, we're going to be talking about the gender identity things and so on during Sunday school. And they even speak in there about the whole idea of, uh, you know, we know that God has made man and God has made woman. He's made them both in the image of God. And with that being said, there's nothing else. Anything else is rebellion against God. Not the only sin, but it is still a sin. You know, whatever that, uh, no matter what culture says, and it's amazing how culture seems to be so enlightened that now they understand with science all these things. It's one of amongst many sinful conditions. Rebellion is what it comes down to. When we try to lead God, or we lead in our own life, we are rebelling against God, that's simply put. Because he says we're to follow him. Deny ourselves and take up a cross and follow him. So can you follow if you lead? When well, it comes to Jesus, certainly not. If we try to do so, we will lead, but we will lead others astray. Of course, you can be a leader in life, but you need to be a leader who is following Jesus. Otherwise, it's sad. So how is your following of Jesus doing? 
Do you sense the warning to Peter is a warning to you too? Sometimes I say, yeah, to me too, you know. We need to remember where to follow, not to lead him. Then we need to get behind Jesus and follow him. Follow him even to death. For in Jesus, of course, is life. Life eternal. There's more that can be said on leadership and, uh, and this. But really simply, I think that's the best. What's the best kind of elected leader, elected official, you're going to have? It's one who recognizes that they are, need to be submissive to God. That he's the leader. And if you've got that, you're going to have a pretty good leader, I think. Their social skills may not be perfect, but at least they understand who they're accountable to. And we need to know that too. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you so much for sending Jesus. Lord Jesus, thank you so much for coming here. Thank you so much for leading your disciples. Thank you so much for rebuking them. So you know, when you rebuked Peter, you, rebu you rebuked all of them. And Lord, Heavenly, Heavenly Father, you rebuke us too, will you, when we need to be? Because we do want to follow you. We do want to have you in charge. We do want to deny ourselves. We do want to take up our cross and follow you, knowing that in trusting you, we have life eternal and purpose in life. Thank you, Father. Help us to do this every day. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's sing this pretty song, loving for, Living for Jesus and Loving for Him too, but 506 in your red book. Please stand.
Let's pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the glory, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above the heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Spirit.